Today we're kicking off a brand new series and I'm gonna start off with a question. And the question is simply this. How many of you at the beginning of 2020 made the mistake of buying a 2020 planner? <laughs> I think it's safe to say that you can go ahead and throw that out or you can take it out back and light it on fire, whichever you choose. Might be a little dark for you, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about you, but I found myself, as we're sort of rounding the corner, which by the way, we're rounding the corner into 2021. Is anybody else excited about that? As we've come closer to 2021, I found myself feeling like if we can just make it from December 31st, 2020 to January 1st, 2021, everything somehow is gonna magically go back to normal. And I've been laughing at myself, like this thing is in me, like I just think, I mean 2020 has just been one weird year. It's just, maybe it's just an off year and we need to put it in a box and wrap it five times over in caution tape and put it on the shelf and write, do not open in big block letters. Like 2020 is like Jumanji. <laughs> like whatever you do, don't open the box. Don't play the game, because if you do, bad things are gonna happen. And I found this thing in me, this longing, this desire for something better, and I think many of us are in the same place. And the reality is we're longing for this because 2020 has been such a hard year. And it's been such a hard year for so many people, not just here at home, but abroad. I mean, resources being cut off People are, are suffering in enormous ways, more than we can imagine, but even here at home. It's been an incredibly difficult year. We, we've got the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, we've got social and societal unrest, political tensions are at an all-time high. We've talked about the fact that depression and anxiety and addiction and alcohol sales all are out the roof. I mean, people are just trying to figure out how do I survive this year, and maybe you were let go from your job and you're trying to figure out how to make ends meet and how you're gonna make it to whatever your next job is gonna be, how you're gonna make it through this in-between time. Maybe you unexpectedly have had a loved one go home to heaven and you feel like they went home far too soon and you're dealing with the grief of all of that. And 2020 has been a really hard year for a whole lot of people. And maybe for some of you in the room or watching online, maybe that's you. And at the end of all of that, it leaves us longing for something better, longing for something more. And it can leave us looking up toward heaven and saying, God, where are you? Where are you? What are you doing? Do you see my life? Do you see my situation? Do you see what I'm going through? Do, do you know the pain that I'm enduring right now? Do you know the uncertainty that is my life? Do you know what's happening? Do you see me? Do you care? Why are you silent? And many of us are asking that question. Maybe today, maybe this week, maybe throughout this year, maybe the last 10 years you've been asking that question. And what Pastor Steve and I wanna invite you into during the next three weeks as we launch this new Christmas series is to journey with us back to the very first Christmas. Because contrary to modern portrayals of the nativity scene, it's joyful, peaceful, serene. What we learn is that the world that Christ was born into is anything but joyful, peaceful, and serene. And so today, we're gonna to talk about Israel's hope, God's silence, and the fullness of time. Let's talk about Israel's hope. Because what's hard for us to grasp is that for thousands of years, the people of God had been awaiting and longing for their Messiah, for their deliverer to come and deliver them from all of their oppressors once and for all. 
that, that they would finally be free of their own oppression and they would be able to, to live under the rule and reign of their coming Messiah. And we as Westerners, modern Westerners, we have the advantage of looking back and reading through scripture and seeing all of these things that came to pass. But if you put yourself in their shoes, if you put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites, you think about just some of the things that they went through. 400 years of slavery in Egypt, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The book of Judges talks about these cycles of deliverance and oppression and deliverance and oppression over and over and over and over again. And what you see throughout the entire Old Testament is that God's people suffer. Israel suffered. God's people faced horrendous injustice. And the majority of the time, it's fascinating, the majority of the time their suffering is actually their own fault. Because they turn away from God, they abandon God, they rebel against God, and because of that, they suffer. But the, the, the story of the Old Testament is not just about the fact that God's people turn their back on God. That's a part of the story, but it's not the whole story. See, the point of the entire Old Testament is that even when God's people are faithless, God is faithful. That even when God's people turn their back on him, God pursued them with a relentless love, and he never gave up, he never quit. That even when God's people are disloyal and betray him, he is sacrificially loyal to them. That's the story of the Old Testament. And see, what you and I have to understand is that God, throughout the entire Old Testament, is he's making these commitments and promises to his people. That, that, that he's leaving the, the, the breadcrumbs of the when, where, how, and why of the Messiah when he would come on to the world stage, when he would appear, when he would break in on human history. And you see that all of the promises and the prophecies, not just surrounding the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, but the prophecies surrounding just the birth of Christ alone are overwhelming. And here's a few of them. I mean, God pronounces, this is fascinating, one verse in the third chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis 3.15, God is pronouncing a judgment on the serpent in the garden, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, her seed, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In the first book of the Bible, the third chapter of the first book of the Bible, we have a prophecy telling us that the Messiah would be born of a woman, but not only that, that the Messiah would grow up and suffer, but that in his suffering he would deal a crushing and fatal blow to the deceiver. That in his suffering he would crush the serpent. That's the third chapter of the first book of the Bible. Also in Genesis 12, Genesis 17, Numbers 24, which by the way, if you're taking notes, don't feel the need to rush through these because the notes will be posted on the website whenever the sermon is posted later today. You can download it and view it there. But in all these verses, we're told that the Messiah would come from the bloodline of Abraham, but not just Abraham. He'd come through the bloodline of Isaac and Jacob as well. And you read the genealogy in Matthew chapter one to see that Christ is the fulfillment of that. Written 700 years before the birth of Christ. Isaiah said this in, in chapter seven, verse 14. He says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So, so far, the Messiah is gonna be born of a woman, is gonna come from the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and is gonna be born of a virgin, and his name will be Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Also written about 700 years before the birth of Christ is Micah chapter five, verse two where it says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. This little, I mean this tiny little obscure town of Bethlehem in all of Judah, this tiny, no name, no reputation town, that the Messiah would come out of that town written 700 years before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. Jeremiah 31, 15 tells us that the Messiah's birth would set off a series of events that would lead to the slaughter of children. 
Hosea 11 tells us that the Messiah would journey out of Egypt at one point. Isaiah chapter nine, that he would be an heir to the throne of David. And we know that Jesus Christ came through the bloodline of David. Now get this, I love this. Psalm 45, it says that the Messiah at his birth would be anointed with myrrh. And what did the wise men bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All of this is to say that God all along was leaving breadcrumbs. He was giving hints and clues as to when and where and how and who the Messiah would come. How he'd show up on the world stage, what that would be like, the events surrounding that. And all throughout the Old Testament, there's the people of God longing and yearning for their coming Messiah, for their deliverer. They're hoping for it. They're waiting for it. They're looking for it. They're expecting it. And there are times, as you read throughout the Old Testament, you see that Israel's expectancy is incredibly high, and there are times when their expectancy is incredibly low. And they lose hope, and they fall into despair and wonder, when? I mean, how many of the Psalms, how long, O Lord? How many of the Psalms are written that way? It's Israel's people looking for their long-awaited Messiah and not knowing how long it would take for him to show up, wondering if God was gonna fulfill the promises that he made. That's Israel's hope. Let's talk about God's silence. Because what many of us don't realize is that between the last words of the Old Testament the book of Malachi, and the first words of the New Testament, there was actually a span of 400 years where there was not a single word from God. No prophet, no warnings, no blessings, no instruction, no scripture, nothing from God for 400 years. Now just to put that in perspective, the United States of America has been a country for 244 years. We're just over the halfway point of just Israel's years of silence from God. And yet somehow we still think that we're the center of the universe in America. 400 years of not a single word from God. Can you imagine I mean, generations before you and generations after you, and not a word, no glimmer of hope, no sign, nothing, just complete and total silence from God. If you're living during that time, and you're Israel, and I'm living during that time, and I'm Israel, I'm wondering what in the world God was doing. Was he taking a nap? Like, what, what, was he hibernating? Where, where, would, where what was he up to? Of all the things. Look at your people, look at the promises you made, and you just go dark for 400 years? What could you possibly be doing? Why did you forsake us? Why did you abandon us? And they would have been tempted to believe what every single one of us are tempted to believe in our moments of silence. When God seems silent or distant or cold, they would have believed what we're tempted to believe when we feel like God is not answering our prayers. He's not coming through the way we need him to. We're praying, we're asking, we're seeking, we're knocking, we're doing all the things the scripture tells us to do and it just feels like our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Maybe it feels like God has taken 400 years to answer your prayers. We'd be tempted to believe the very same thing that they believed. Anybody in the room today, have you ever experienced seasons of silence from God? It's a whole lot of us. And for some of us, you're experiencing that silence today, or maybe this week, or maybe this year, or maybe for the last 10 years, this has been your experience, that God just feels uncaring, distant, cold, that he doesn't really see you or care about what's going on in your world. Maybe you're in the room and maybe God's silence at one moment in your life has even caused you to question whether or not God actually exists. And there's no shame in that. Because the devil 
If he can keep you from Jesus, that's his number one goal. The second goal is to convince you that God is either not good or he's not in control and doesn't care about your life. And if he can convince you of those things, then he's winning. So if you feel like God has been silent, I want you to know that you're not alone. But I also want you to know that it's oftentimes when God is silent when he does his best work. It's in the seasons of silence when God feels far away, distant, cold, where he's up to something big. So that begs the question, if Israel had 400 years of silence from God, what was God doing? What in the world was he up to? What did he do during that time? Where did he go? Now, we're gonna talk about the fullness of time. What we don't have is an exact scripture reference to go to because there were 400 years of silence. So we don't have a scripture reference, but we do, what we do have is human history. And every historian on the planet, whether they believe in Jesus or not, it doesn't matter, every scholar, every historian would tell you that these events that I'm about to tell you from human history actually happened during the 400 years of silence, that this happened during that period of time. And, and I'm not gonna give you a whole long history lesson. I'm gonna give you three events that actually took place during the 400 years of silence that give us just a glimpse of maybe what God was up to during that time. The first one is this. A man by the name of Philip of Macedon. Not very well known. He was a great military leader. And he was the king of Macedon from 359 B.C. to 336 B.C. And he conquered Athens and Thebes and created a federation of Greek states called the League of Corinth. And he did this in order to unite a Grecian army that he would be able to then lead against the Persian Empire and conquer them. But his reign was cut short when he was assassinated in 336. And he was succeeded by his son, and his name was Alexander. You know him as Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, to this day, is known as the greatest military leader of all time that has ever lived. Brilliant military strategist, and through Alexander the Great, the Greeks expanded their rule and their reign and their empire across the known world at the time, so much so that Alexander, toward the end of his life, he actually said, I'm depressed because there are no more worlds to conquer. And so this guy, I mean, he was driven to no end, but he was also an alcoholic. And when he was 32 years old, he died, and there's debate to whether or not it was the alcohol that killed him or somebody poisoned him. We don't know what exactly caused it, but what we do know is this. Before he died, he made an incredibly strategic and important decision. Because in conquering all of the regions that he did and expanding the Greek empire as much as he did, there were all these different languages that were spoken which made communication and giving orders. It made it really difficult. And so what Alexander the Great did before he died is he decreed that everybody in the known world would become fluent in one common language. And that language was Koine Greek or common Greek. Anybody know what the New Testament was written in? Koine Greek. Could it be, could it be that what the world thought was a brilliant military decision by Alexander the Great was actually God orchestrating details behind the scenes to set about the perfect environment for his son to come into the world? Could it be that this idea for one common language, that it wasn't Alexander's, it was God just implanting that idea into his heart one night? And Alexander's taking credit for it, thinking he's something great, and God's looking down from heaven saying, dude, you have no idea. <laughs> That's the first thing. The second thing, actually before that, he, here's what's fascinating. Proverbs, Proverbs tells us, I love this, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. 
Like, like God is influencing kings and empires and rulers to bring about what he wants to be. And this is exactly what he did with Alexander. That's the first thing. So one common language. Second thing is this. Not too long after, another world power arose and conquered the Greeks, and we know them as the Roman Empire. Now the Romans brought some good into the world, and they brought a whole lot of bad into the world. They brought a lot of brutality and violence, but they also brought some good into the world. And one of the things they instituted during the expanse of their empire and their reign in the world was what's called the Pax Romana, which literally means the peace of Rome. And what this allowed to happen during that time across their entire empire was for the, the ease of travel, for people to travel freely without fear of violence or brutality, without fear of being attacked or killed because there was a guarantee of protection from the Roman government. So it allowed people to travel freely from city to city without fear. And the third thing that happened is that also during the peace of Rome, during this time, the Romans completely revolutionized their road system and they built highways, incredibly sophisticated roads from major city to major city to the, the major trade ports of the Mediterranean world from military bases and encampments, they built this incredibly intricate and complicated road system that not only made travel safe, but made it easy. So what you have in this particular moment in human history that has never existed to this extent is one common language, the guarantee of protection while you're traveling, and the ease of travel. And then Christ is born. Can you believe that? That when God went silent, he was orchestrating details and pieces behind the scene, empires and world leaders and systems in place so that when his son would break in on human history, the world would be perfectly set up for the gospel to go everywhere. See, the reason why we are in this room, we know the name of Jesus 2,000 years later, the reason why we know the story of Christmas, that a little boy was born to a teenage girl in a little no-name town of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, the reason why we know that is because of what God did during the 400 years of silence. And if God can do that during the 400 years of silence, what might he do in yours? If God can do that with 400 years of silence, what could he do with your silence? What can't he do with your silence when God feels distant? I'm telling you, it's when God is silent that he does his best work. You just wait and see what he's gonna do. See, this is exactly what Paul tells us in Galatians chapter four. He says, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. When the fullness of time had come, when the set time had come, when the appointed moment had come, when, when everything was set up the way God saw fit, then he sends his son to be born of a woman in an obscure little town called Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel like God is silent right now in your life? You feel like God is distant and cold and far off, that he's plugged his ears and he's not listening to your prayers. For whatever reason, he's delaying his answer to your prayers, to what you've been pleading for. You feel like no matter how hard you pray, it feels like God is just ignoring you, that he doesn't care. Listen, church, that could not be further from the truth. God sees you, he knows, he knows. The tears that you've cried, the prayers that you've prayed, he knows. And if God was at work during the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, you can trust even, that even though you can't see exactly what he's up to or what he's doing, you can trust that he's up to something. 
and he's up to something good. And he's up to something for your good. And see, what the very first Christmas tells us is that just because you feel forgotten doesn't mean that you are. Look, I'm not gonna do an altar call this morning, but I, do invite, I wanna invite you to respond. If you feel like, right now, in this moment, you feel like God has been silent in your life, you feel like God has been distant, you feel like God maybe has abandoned you or forsaken you in some way, that you've, you've questioned maybe even the existence of God, that you're beginning to doubt his goodness or his kindness toward you, or he's allowed something to happen in your life over the last year and you're looking out at it saying, God, how could you be good and how could you be in control if you would allow something like this? If you're there, maybe you're watching online, or you're on campus or you're in the room right here. If you feel like God has been silent and maybe it's this week, maybe it's this month, this year, or the last 10 years, would you just put your hand up in the air? If you feel like God has been silent, that maybe, Feel like God has abandoned you to fend for yourself, left you to fend for yourself. You feel like God's silence means that he's absent. And look, mass confession is good for the soul, by the way. If you're around somebody with their hand raised in the air, I wanna invite you, just lay a hand on their shoulder and extend a hand their way and we're gonna pray in church. This isn't just me praying, this is us agreeing in prayer together. Because we all know what it's like to go through seasons of silence. And it's in those moments where we need the church, we need one another to hold us up. And we're gonna do that right now. And we're gonna respond to God. But we're gonna seek him and ask and knock and lift up those who feel like they're going through silence right now. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that in the first Christmas, God, you broke 400 years of silence. That with the birth of Christ, the silence was broken. We thank you for the hope, for the promise God, we thank you that even though there are moments in our lives when it feels like we've been abandoned and forsaken, thank you for the promise of Christmas that tells us that no matter how we feel, we can look back on the birth of Jesus as a guarantee that you will never leave us or forsake us and that you've pursued us with a relentless love. God, for every single person who had their hand raised, God, I'm asking right now that this moment, this day, They've been questioning where you are, what you're doing, feel like they've been forgotten by you. God, I pray that this moment would be a moment where they would be able to put a flag in the sand and say, no, I know that God sees me, I know that he knows because of the Christmas story, because of what Jesus Christ has done. I pray that this would be an altar type moment where they would look back on this and know that you are with them, you are for them, no matter how silent the silence gets that they would know and trust that you're with them, that you're for them, even when it feels like you're not. And God, that you would give every single one of us the ability to trust that you, God, the good and sovereign God, that you are working all things together for good, even though awful things, even the incredibly difficult things, the most painful things. You're working even those things out for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And God, I pray that you would fill every single one of us watching online here in the room this morning with the hope that Christmas brings that even in the silence, you're there, you're working, you're doing incredible things. And so God, we bring our need to you. 
and we surrender to you again. We give everything over to you and ask you to have your way, your purpose in the middle of the silence. Amen, somebody. Amen. So guys, listen, we're gonna spend a few minutes and we're gonna respond to God. We're gonna respond in worship and praise and maybe for you right now, that means sitting quietly and reflecting on what God might be doing in the middle of your silence. And maybe for you, that means standing and taking a stand and raising your hands and singing at the top of your lungs and praising God and shouting toward heaven. And maybe for you, look, the altar's open. Maybe that means you coming forward and kneeling before the altar and saying, God, I surrender my life to you again. I've doubted your goodness. I haven't trusted in your faithfulness. And I'm coming back to you and I'm surrendering my life again. Maybe that's you. But however the Holy Spirit is leading you to respond right now, we are going to respond as a body of believers together. Because Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, he is worthy of everything that we are and everything that we have, even when he's speaking and he seems near, and even when he feels quiet and distant and cold, he is still worthy of all the honor, all the power, all the glory forever. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. Let's worship him, let's respond to him, let's do business with God, come on.